He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, ko William Ray Aho. Welcome to Black Sheep. If you cast a fishing line into a pond or a stream around Auckland or Waikato, you might hook something which looks a bit unusual. A fish with bright silver scales and vivid red fins. It's called a rud, and like a lot of animals which call New Zealand home, it's not native to this country. The Department of Conservation's website describes rudd as the possums of the waterways, voracious feeders which chew through native plants and hoover up small invertebrates, out-competing smaller native fish. Rudd are considered a noxious pest in most parts of Aotearoa, but they're now so common in Auckland and Waikato, they've been declared an acclimatised species. That means they're so widespread, the authorities have just given up trying to get rid of them. Doc's website goes on to say this. The species was illegally introduced into New Zealand in 1967 via a private consignment of juvenile rudd, which were then reared to adulthood and encouraged to breed. The resulting fish were then deliberately and strategically introduced into a number of lakes and ponds in the Waikato. Rudd have since been progressively spread illegally around lakes, ponds and rivers throughout the North Island, as well as Canterbury and Nelson. But the Department of Conservation's website really sells this story short. It doesn't mention that all this illegal introduction and spreading was mostly the work of one man. He was a devout communist with a stubborn streak a mile wide. A conspiracy theorist who spent World War II poaching trout in a conscientious objector camp. A kind of environmental imperialist who went on a 40-year crusade, illegally stocking New Zealand's waterways with all kinds of introduced fish. His name was Stuart Smith. He can be positioned alongside the folks that brought us rabbits and stoats and possums. This is Brian Winters. He's a Tauranga-based author who wrote an authorised biography of Stuart Smith. It's called That Pommy Bastard. He can be positioned there. No question about that. Initially, I thought the title of Brian's book was maybe a little bit harsh, But it turns out Stuart Smith himself suggested it. He asked for the book to be written as part of his will after he died in 2008. That might tell you something about his character and his sense of humour. If you want to understand why Stuart Smith dedicated so much of his life to illegal fish introduction, you have to go back to his childhood. Smith was born in 1913 in the East End of London, These days, the East End's a fancy part of town, but when Smith was born, it was basically a slum. I think he had a reasonably um, pleasant childhood. Uh, His father was uh, in an above-average sort of capacity for those days, a manager down at the docks, um, and people would doff their caps to him. In the early 1900s, the East End was surrounded by small ponds, the legacy of workers digging out clay for building brick houses. These ponds were Stuart Smith's playground. Years later, he wrote about catching fish as a five-year-old kid with a homemade rod. It was just as much fun as a marlin is for a grown-up and considerably less expensive. And I discovered there was money to be made. The ornamental waters in Wanstead Park had some good pike, and grown-ups would pay a penny or or an apenny each for gudgeon or small roach to be used as live bait. Catching and selling these little fish, Stuart Smith eventually earned enough pennies to buy his first bicycle, 
He was bright too. When he turned 11, he won a scholarship for a decent school and was always in the top three of his class. So, looking in from the outside, it seems like a pretty good start in life for a working class kid. But in the summer holidays of 1928, when Smith turned 15, his life changed forever. My father said quite casually, you're not going back to school, you're going to New Zealand. And this is a bit of a tangent, this, but I didn't realise how widespread that sort of thing was. Uh, the sending of children that, you know, didn't have very good out, you know, parents and that, to Australia, huge big contingent there. And then I don't know if you'd heard about the, the train that used to leave New York bundled up with um, children from found on the streets and they'd just send them out to the west and they would be adopted out there by families who didn't know them. It's kind of the stuff we can't imagine, but it was big back then. Stuart Smith said he accepted this decision to ship him and his brother to the other side of the world pretty quickly. And that might be because things in his house had been going bad for a while. I knew something was radically wrong. When I was in bed and my parents were in the kitchen, I'd heard my father horribly abusing me mother because my younger sister was born and I knew they had real money problems. I also knew that my father loved gambling with cards with a bunch of locals and was a bad loser. Dad had decided the best way out of it was to get rid of me and me brother Edwin because we cost too much to keep. Like Brian Winters said, this was a harsh reality for lots of kids in the late 1920s. The Great Depression was starting to bite and without a modern welfare system, lots of parents couldn't afford to keep their kids fed, even if they didn't have the added pressure of a gambling problem. New Zealand was also struggling with the Depression, but there was also a huge demand for farm workers. So the New Zealand government paid to ship thousands of poor British boys to Aotearoa. It was sort of a win-win. British parents had one less mouth to feed and New Zealand farmers got a source of cheap labour. Stuart Smith washed up in kafia, but he wasn't a big fan of farming. He spent every free minute out in a fishing boat in the local harbour. As soon as our lines at the bottom, we were pulling up snapper as hard as we could go. I thought to myself, this is a life. Why would anyone want to work on a farm when there is an ocean full of fish just waiting to be pulled up? So, as soon as he could, Smith headed over to Tauranga, where he tried to start a career as a fisherman. He caught the eye of a guy called Jack Alec, head of the local harbour board. Jack taught Smith the basics of commercial fishing, but he also passed on a lot of his political beliefs. Jack Alec converted Stuart Smith to communism. You hear about people that have a religious conversion, and it's a bit like that. And then, wow, they want to go out and change the world. He saw the light, you know, and then he could <laughs> see all the class plays and everything fell into place. Smith lived with Jack Alec for six months and devoured everything he could learn about communism. He had a wonderful library, depending on whether you consider a pile of communist literature a wonderful library. I did, and all the time I was there, I soaked it up like a sponge. Worse still, it stayed with me more or less ever since. You have to remember the context of the times. We're in the 1930s. Communists had swept to power in Russia, overthrowing what was widely seen as an autocratic and brutal regime. The rest of the world had yet to see the darker side of Soviet-style communism. For many people, communism looked like the way of the future, particularly when they saw how badly ordinary people were suffering in capitalist states during the Great Depression. Smith was among those swept up by dreams of a communist utopia. He later became a member of the New Zealand Communist Party. But while he was waiting for the workers' revolution, he still had to scrape out a living. Fishing, fixing nets, working at the docks, 
It's almost like a gig economy back then, wasn't it? You were sort of working for a guy one day and then you're off to the next and he's going to give you part shares and what you catch and you don't catch anything. And uh, it was pretty hand to mouth. There are all kinds of tall stories about Stuart Smith in these years. He seems to have been a real character. One of my favourite stories was one time he was apparently getting ready to go fishing with explosives, but a piglet got into his shed and ate all his detonators. He was so angry that he kicked the pig, which then exploded. But those adventures came to an end with the beginning of World War II. We range ourselves without fear beside Britain. Where she goes, we go. Where she stands, we stand. We are only a small and young nation. Stuart Smith was called up for service. He volunteered for the Navy, but was told he had to serve with the Army instead. For Smith, this was a disaster. He was terrified of joining the Army. Why? Well, he believed that if he was sent overseas with the Army, his beliefs as a communist would put him in danger from his fellow troops. Yeah, that word would get out amongst the troops uh, that were fighting and you would be taken out in patrol with a group, say, in Germany or Italy, and then they'd get rid of you. Smith claimed this was widely held knowledge in communist circles. Alec Drennan, yeah, well known as a Communist Party member, told me, go back to the Navy base and see if you can get in. If you can't, you'll have to go to jail. If you go in the army, they'll take you overseas, take you out on patrol and shoot you. Now, it is true the New Zealand army was a fairly anti-communist institution in the 1940s, but I've checked in with a defence historian and confirmed there is absolutely zero evidence that any communist Kiwis were executed while serving overseas. It sounds like this was probably just a paranoid rumour. But reading about Smith, you get the feeling he could be incredibly stubborn. Once he got an idea in his head, it was just impossible to shake it loose from him. He was also a bit of a conspiracy theorist. He regularly wrote about his beliefs that powerful figures were conspiring against him. And to be fair, that wasn't an entirely unjustified fear for a communist in this era. But anyway, Smith was so convinced by this rumour about the army that he straight up refused to serve. So he was prosecuted and sent off to Hotu detention camp near Tūrangi. It's a prisoner of local conscientious objectors. And as you can imagine, in a war economy, they're hardly at the top of the list when it comes to, you know, feeding arrangements or anything like that. They're a bit of a pest. And so... The camp is starting to run out of food on this very limited budget they've got. But luckily, there was a great source of food just down the road, the Tongariro River, one of the best trout fishing rivers in the whole world. Someone seems to have told the camp authorities that Smith had a background as a fisherman, so they asked if he could catch some trout to supplement their food supply. I started to laugh. I couldn't help myself. What they were suggesting was illegal. I knew it, and they knew it. And he found that immensely humorous. Immensely humorous. Uh, To him, it just displayed all the contradictions of the capitalist system. I, I, I think that... It probably helped cement the socialist thing in. Personally, I struggle to see what Stuart Smith found so funny about all of this. I mean, lots of rules get bent or broken during war, and trout poaching hardly seems like a big deal in the context of the times. But I guess there is some irony in being asked to break the law while you're in prison. Anyway, Smith was never a guy to do a job half-baked. If he wasn't a communist, you get the feeling he would have been a really good CEO. He then concocts quite an arrangement of, quite an infrastructure, you know. uh, You can imagine almost a mini factory inside the prison camp and he's training these guys and 
separating out the tasks and some are fishing and some are gutting and some are slicing and some are smoking. It would be it would be a hang of a thing to, you know, to take a camera in and see, wouldn't it? At one point, Smith City caught between 35 to 40 trout every day for seven weeks. And with an operation that big, news eventually made it down to Wellington. Well, the politicians heard what he was doing and they smoked trout. They thought, wow, are we getting a shipment? And so they have to end up sending a special load down occasionally to Parliament buildings to keep them shut up. Again, that probably only served to reinforce Smith's ideas about corrupt capitalist leaders. After the war ended, Stuart Smith was released, and he was at a bit of a loose end. He you know, was not a house owner, he didn't have anything. Uh, he'd just come out of four or five years in a you know, conscientious um, war camp. So he ends up getting this piece of land in Massey and putting this gas station on it, uh, Caltex one, I believe. And he worked hard at that, like for 16 years. And that got him to the point where Caltex himself came along, kind of bought out half of his property and gave him a rent. And he was able to live fundamentally the rest of his days with that rent money flowing in. So he had the money, he had the time, and he's now, you know, he's able to move towards his childhood interests of fishing. But not just any kind of fishing. Stuart Smith wasn't interested in surf casting or trolling or fly fishing or any of the kinds of fishing that most other Kiwis enjoyed. Stuart Smith was keen on coarse fishing. Coarse fishing means fishing in ponds, lakes, small streams, usually in parks or just on the outskirts of a town or city. It's super popular in Europe. Like if you go to any park in summer, you'll probably see a bunch of blokes sitting around a pond with rods and reels and camp chairs. The reason it's got the word coarse in there is because it's only coarse people or lower class people that do that sort of thing. So he's promoting that. Uh, because he's a his own little battler for the working class. That's how I read it anyway. Coarse fishers catch all kinds of different species, like rudd, tench, perch, roach, carp, gudgeon. But those kind of fish didn't exist in New Zealand. Our native fish are mostly small and nocturnal. The only time most people catch them is in their larval stage as whitebait. European settlers had introduced trout and salmon to New Zealand's rivers for sport fishing back in the 1800s. But, of course, we're talking about Stuart Smith here, so he had some very strong beliefs about trout fishing. Sort of high-class fishing, you know, leads driving their Range Rovers up to Scottish Glens to, or flying in via helicopter to go trout fishing. So there's an ideological side to this, and... Maybe Smith was a bit sick of the taste of trout after his time in that camp during the war. But it's also clear he sort of wanted to recapture his happier days as a kid, fishing in those ponds around his home in the East End. He wrote endless letters to the newspapers arguing his case. If children are to become interested in wildlife, angling is part of their education. If the pond is made large enough, with a sheltered nesting area in the centre, it could be stocked with rudd and tench to provide angling for the children. The right of children to fish is a basic part of human history, but there are those here who would make it otherwise. Over my dead body. By this point, we're in the 1960s. Smith's in his 40s. He never married, didn't have any kids. What he did have was time, money, and an almost fanatical level of devotion to his cause. 
and he dedicated the entire second half of his life to a one-man mission, introducing coarse fishing to New Zealand. The amount of damage that he did is incalculable. This is Charlie Mitchell, the national science correspondent for Stuff.co.nz. He wrote an article about Stuart Smith, and in the process he spoke to lots of officials and experts who had dealings with Smith over the years. You know, someone in my story I quote compares it to, say, one person introducing possums and stoats and rats and and that sort of thing, and this was just one person who did the equivalent in our fresh water. It probably wasn't that difficult for Stuart Smith to start importing these fish to New Zealand. In the 1960s, you could basically import any kind of fish you wanted, so long as you said you planned to keep them in an aquarium. From there, it was just a matter of breeding them. And Smith did this on a near-industrial scale. He had these enormous fish tanks in his garage. He had various vehicles that he had outfitted to be able to drive around and um, store fish in them for days at a time. He was not a hobbyist, that's for sure. He, he, he saw this as a, as a job in its own right, I think. To me, it feels more like a multi-decade-long crusade. The amount of time and effort he put into this cause is extraordinary. Smith invented his own oxygenation and feeding systems to raise his fish. Like Charlie mentioned, he converted his car into a sort of mobile aquarium for transporting his fish around the country. He documented all of it in exhaustive detail. Went up the peninsula from Waiuku to Barry Lee's place, put 22 young rudd in his top lily pond. Came back about seven miles and had a quick look at the two deep trout ponds and had a yarn with the owner, who seemed rather disappointed when I decided not to put any fish in. Had a look into the big lake, but it was too wet to drive down to. Came back to Aka Aka and put uh, 120 rudd in Helen's Canal. And just like any good revolutionary, Smith wanted people to know about what he was doing. In fact, he regularly wrote to the newspapers about it. I was delighted to read your article about the Waihau River between Te Araha and Matamata becoming an angler's paradise. As no one seems to know why this should have happened, may I suggest the fact that in 1973 I liberated well over 2,000 rudd in that stretch of river. Articles like this seem to have finally brought Smith's actions to the attention of local authorities. In November 1973, the Department of Agriculture caught up with him and poisoned his fish tanks with chlorine. But typically for Smith, he refused to back down. He was totally convinced that his cause was righteous. Instead, he got into a long-running battle with the Auckland Acclimatisation Society over his efforts to introduce fish, One member of the society was quoted as saying this about Smith. If this man had done the same things with poisonous snakes, he would have been shot. The fish that Stuart Smith was releasing were destructive each in their own ways. The species that he released the most of was rudd. And rudd, they're omnivorous, but they mostly eat vegetations. Aquatic plants are quite important to regulating the water quality. And they're also a food source for some of our native species. So when you suddenly introduce all these rudd into a a waterway that has never had them before, it completely changes the dynamic. And what Stuart Smith would often do was release rudd into, say, a lake, and he would realise eventually that rudd was sort of dominating the waterway. And so he would try to address this by releasing perch into the waterway. And perch are brutally carnivorous. When they reach certain concentrations, they they eat each other. They're cannibalistic. Um, And so he would hope that the perch would eat all the rudd, and then all of a sudden you have a perch problem. And then, you, you know, you get this escalating issue where it sort of spirals out of control. Stuart Smith made all kinds of arguments in favour of his efforts, and they weren't all about fishing. He claimed his fish could help clean up algal blooms and provide a food source for trout, although I should say those arguments are pretty strongly rejected by most fish scientists. In any case, he didn't win many supporters. Brian Winters again. And here's where we get down to personalities. 
Um, he was an aggravating personality and he had the establishment against him. So I don't think that they're going to turn around and actually say, oh, Stuart, that was a great idea, putting Rudd in and enabling all those Aucklanders and all their kids to be able to catch fish up there. What a cracking good idea. No, that's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> I mean, it is amazing the level of hostility between um, Smith and the, the Auckland Acclimatisation Association or whatever it is. Like, the, the letters they write back and forth in the newspaper are just sort of <laughs> incredibly vindictive. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, um, it's like a boxing fight, isn't it? Smith claimed the environmental risks of introducing fish were massively overstated. A red herring, if you'll excuse my terrible pun. Typically for Stuart Smith, he believed he was the victim of a conspiracy. He thought the real opposition to coarse fishing came from big trout fishing companies in Rotorua and Taupo. All the laws pertaining to freshwater fishing in New Zealand are basically designed to prevent any competition that could possibly entice tourists away to other areas. To fish for bass in our Waikato or northern lakes and so to make sure that bass are never introduced here. He's got a point. I mean, the, the, the trout industry exists here because of the money. Let's get real on that. It does seem like a bit of a double standard. Like, if it's OK to introduce salmon and trout to our rivers, what's wrong with introducing other kinds of fish? I wanted to get into this debate with someone who really knew their stuff, so I went up to Te Papa Museum and met Andrew Stewart, assistant curator of vertebrates and one of New Zealand's foremost fish experts. Stuart Smith's name is one that Andrew knows well. He, he's infamous, famous, notorious for being incredibly focused on his mission. It would be about on a par with somebody breeding up ferrets and stoats and then releasing them. I, I do want to kind of get into this debate a little bit because he write, writes about this constantly. He writes about it in terms of a conspiracy. He says that, you know, DOC and the Auckland Acclimatisation Association are in league with the trout fisheries and basically saying that the only reason these fish aren't wanted in New Zealand is because they would compete with trout for, for sort of sport fishing. Is that a theory that you buy into? It's a theory. There's been a huge shift in, in the way people think about the freshwater fish fauna of New Zealand. The early arrivals looked around and went, it's nothing, it's boring, why do we care? We want the, the things we had at home. We want trout, salmon, we want perch, we want this, that and the other. And there was this huge push to release um, animals and, and fish in particular into New Zealand to create it as a kind of sportsman's paradise where you could hunt and fish and shoot without the restrictions that you had back in England with land ownership. Most scientists in the 1800s and early 1900s warned about the dangers of introduced mammals to New Zealand's native animals. Like, here's a quote from a report analysing New Zealand's wildlife policies. It was written in 1922 by a guy called George Thompson. It has hitherto been carried on in a most haphazard and irresponsible manner. One district imports stoats and weasels in order to cope with the rabbit pest. Another destroys them whenever they're found because they threaten the total destruction of native bird life. But George Thompson was much more relaxed about introducing fish. A measure of good has been achieved notably in stocking our nearly empty rivers with fine food and sport fish. How widespread of an idea was that? That was very widespread. We, do, we don't have large native fish here apart from the eels, one species of, of rather shy galaxid, and the now extinct grayling. Mm. So the, the place was sort of looked at as empty, as a, as a blank canvas. We, we have a huge suite of galaxids and uh, little bullies in the family Eleotridae. We're starting to shift in the way we, we think about these things now. We're starting to realise that these are Tonga. They don't occur anywhere else. We need to protect them. They have a huge cultural importance to Māori. But for a long time, that just was not appreciated. So Stuart Smith's ideas about introducing fish 
weren't necessarily crazy, but they were out of date. He was sort of a relic of how we used to think about New Zealand's freshwater ecosystems. But he wasn't alone. Charlie Mitchell says there was a network of people all over Auckland and Waikato who were prepared to help him spread introduced fish. In a lot of his notes, he he refers to people who he had sort of recruited to help him. And a lot of the time, they are children. So he would be walking around Hamilton and he would meet a couple of children who are fishing and he would get them to help him release fish into another waterway. Um, he had adult friends who would occasionally help him. And it's not entirely clear whether they knew it was illegal or not. Eventually, in 1975, Smith won a major victory. Rudd were declared an acclimatised fish by the Auckland Acclimatisation Society. For some years now, the society has had problems with a hard core of enthusiastic but misguided persons illegally liberating coarse fish throughout the district. To combat the further distribution of rudd, this fish has been declared an acclimatised fish by the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. These measures are aimed at bringing the spread of the fish under control rather than being in recognition of the qualities attributed to them. So it was a sort of grudging admission of defeat. Basically, Smith had outgunned the authorities. He spread rudd so broadly across the Waikato and Auckland regions, they had to admit it had become impossible to actually remove them. But Smith didn't stop there. He kept on spreading. According to his own records, he released 15,000 fish into New Zealand's waterways between 1964 and 1987. And of course, those numbers only grew as the fish started to breed in the wild. The authorities finally cracked down. Laws around importing fish were tightened, and in 1987, Smith was raided by the Acclimatisation Society. They confiscated all his fish-spreading gear and left him liable for $22,000 in court-related costs, including a $5,000 fine. After that case, a reporter asked him if he planned to keep spreading fish, to which he replied, I can't afford to get caught, can I? By that, Smith seems to have only meant he was going to be a bit more careful. He stopped recording and publicising his fish-spreading efforts, but he continued his mission covertly. We have no idea how many fish he bred and released after 1987, but probably it could be measured in the thousands. He kept going all the way through the 1990s and up into the 2000s. Brian Winters. That was a quite a sophisticated era. This is this is not bringing fish in in a bucket from you know London anymore. This is coming through the airport quarantine, and it's almost a movie. This old man really confident in what he's doing, joking with everyone, flirting with whoever he can, explaining things away um, and bringing in these illegal fish and then rearing them in his huge ponds. Smith had his final run-in with the authorities in 2005. By this time, he was in his 90s, but still utterly committed to his cause. He gets caught because um, one of these creatures, a sort of a crayfish-like creature, is found walking along the road. A kid found this crayfish outside Smith's garage in 2005. He took it to his parents, who alerted the authorities. The animal was identified as an Australian marin, a species which had never been seen in New Zealand before. Police raided Smith's garage and found not just marin, but thousands of gudgeon, yet another fish Smith was keen to introduce to New Zealand's waterways. It goes right down to Wellington, and they hold a conference there, and they summon experts from all over the realm to descend on Wellington, and they sit through a two-day seminar slash conference slash emergency meeting, wondering what they're going to do. 
about these imported fish uh, and what they're going to do about Stuart Smith. Stuart Smith, on his part, he's the first one to try and turn a problem into an opportunity. And uh, he starts to say, well, these little fish that I've got breeding here, not the crayfish that walk down the street, but these other ones, they make good food for trout. And you've got a feeding problem with trout. Uh, so advance me $50,000 and I'll do a study on the best way to uh, integrate this for the betterment of the nation. I mean, this is after his place has been, you know, raided by the cops, essentially. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. but, but chuck, me a, chuck me a few grand and I'll, um, and I'll tell you the best way to release these fish. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then he goes on from there and, um, and he's not actually prosecuted, even though he's, he's done this. And he's the only one in the country with these, this stuff in these tanks. And I try and track down why he wasn't prosecuted. And the answer that I got back was that while he had possession of these illegal fish, uh, they were unable to prove that he had brought them into the country. M maybe you've really got to, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's in, an, in a legal sense, but he's, who else could it have been? And they're in the ponds on his place. And this is Stuart Smith for crying out loud. <laughs> And uh, so he's, he's not prosecuted. They let him off the hook. The decision not to prosecute Stuart Smith might also have been due to his age. By this point, he was 92. But Charlie Mitchell spoke to some of the experts and officials who took part in that emergency hearing down in Wellington, and they were deeply frustrated Smith wasn't taken much more seriously much earlier. There seemed to be very little consequence for somebody who, who would go around and do this stuff knowingly and, and almost gloatingly. Yeah, because I imagine there must have been attempts to, like, just talk him out of it, to sort of explain exactly the impacts um, of what he was doing. Yes, I spoke to multiple people who said that they had, at one time or another, told Stuart Smith that what he was doing was damaging to native fish. And... All of those people said he, he responded in effectively the same way and, and said something to the effect of, well, they're just New Zealand fish. And, and that, I think, comes back to this environmental imperialism. He seemed to have this inherent belief that, uh, that the fish he grew up with in England were just superior to New Zealand fish. Stuart Smith died in 2008. He was 95 years old. But his legacy is still with us. The fish he released are still incredibly widespread, and a number of coarse fishing clubs have sprung up to catch them. It was only kind of at the end of my reporting that I stumbled across the fact that a lot of these clubs are receiving semi-regular donations from something called the S. Smith Trust, which is clearly tied to Stuart Smith and, and some of the money he left behind and it, it's a significant chunk of, of their annual expenditure is coming from, from the trust and so he is sort of furthering his cause beyond the grave in that way. You could pretty much say 95% of it he got away with it you know, he wasn't a Ned Kelly that was caught and strung up. He crossed the boundary a lot and he got away with it. And I know that that appeals to a lot of New Zealanders. I'll put my cards on the table here. I'm not one of those New Zealanders. I have a hard time seeing Stuart Smith as anything other than a villain. And that's probably partly thanks to my family background. Like, my dad was an environmental engineer. He used to have a poster on his office wall of all New Zealand's native fish, and a big part of his job was finding ways to protect those fish from pollution. He died last year, but I can imagine he'd have some pretty dim views about Stuart Smith too. 
I have to confess, there's still something admirable about Smith. And everyone I talked to about him, they felt the same way. He was a very good um, inventor, a lot of people told me. He invented various devices that were quite clever, like a, a deep fishing trawl. And he invented the thing that they could use to, to keep fish alive in his truck. And that was spread quite widely. So he was a very smart guy. He just worked outside the system. He was never encouraged to contribute to it. He was always, you know, a, an annoyance. I can understand and I can sympathise with him. Growing up, we lived in America for a couple of years and it was a very happy time for me to go down to the local lake and catch bass and sunfish and perch and bring them home and mum would cook them. I absolutely loved it. To keep doing what he did for decades, knowing that people were watching him and that he could be prosecuted at any time, it's remarkable the, the sort of mentality he had. If they'd pulled him into the circle, uh, who knows? The old saying that a poacher makes the best gamekeeper uh, always holds up. He wanted other children to enjoy what he enjoyed. I think he just needed that energy perhaps focused a little better. But he certainly he had this zeal and drive and energy, even though he was stopped so many times. It, it never stopped him from continuing in his mission. Very special thanks to my guests, Andrew Stewart, Brian Winters and Charlie Mitchell. Brian's book has lots more information on Stuart Smith. Its title again is That Pommy Bastard. You should also check out Charlie Mitchell's article on Smith that's on stuff.co.nz with the headline The Liberator, How One Man's 15,000 Pest Fish Changed New Zealand Waterways. Black Sheep is written by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin, and our sound engineer is Phil Benge. We had voice acting help from Duncan Smith, Adam McCauley, Jonathan Mitchell, and Colin Peacock. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe and give us a review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps new people find this show. Also, be sure to check out RNZ's other podcasts. If you want more true crime stuff, check out Crimes NZ where Jesse Mulligan does a new interview every week with a story of Kiwi wrongdoing. You can find that on whatever podcasting app you prefer or on our website, rnz.co.nz. Hi, icons. It's Danny Pellegrino from the pop culture podcast, Everything Iconic, and I love Nordstrom. No place better to shop, particularly during the holiday season, because they have everything. They have holiday decor at Nordstrom. They have cozy cardigans from Barefoot Dreams, my fave. They have cold weather attire, party attire, plus free shipping and free returns, free store pickup. You can also purchase a recycled fabric gift bag so your item arrives festive and wrapped. So check out Nordstrom this holiday season, a one-stop shop. You can explore more at Nordstrom in-store or online at nordstrom.com.